Hey friends, I'm back with my next guest and I don't think I'm over exaggerating when I say he's probably the most recognizable face and voice in Vancouver sports media. It's someone I've admired for a long time. That doesn't necessarily mean we're old, but let's just say I was watching this guy uh, in the 80s. How's that? Or or early 90s. So please welcome Mr. Don Taylor. Don, thanks for being here today. Thanks, Clay. I think it means I'm old is what it means. (laughs) (laughs) But hello to all your followers and hello to you and great to be here. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And yeah, it was funny. Just before we pressed record, we were talking about uh, the ages of our kids. So I think we're about this. We're close to the same age. Not exactly, but close. How's that? Uh, I think you might be surprised. <laughs> yeah. I'm an old guy. <laughs> That's I remember the Beverly Hillbillies. <laughs> well, an old guy who's going to start something new. Let's get right into this newest venture that you have. Donnie and Dolly the team on check. Tell me, let, let's start with, um, how did this happen so quickly? Well, really, it, it almost uh, could have happened quicker. Um, I was contacted by Rob Germain of check and, and you know, we, we had some other offers as well. Or at least I, I, I did and hmm. other people with the uh, 1040 did. And he called me the day after February 9th. February 9th was the day um, uh, we got our walking papers at at 1040, 1040 guns or TSN 1040 guns walking papers. Yeah. 1040 is still around. Um, we don't want to get into that. But no. uh, um, Rob called me the next day. Uh, uh, Rob Germain of Czech called me the next day. Uh, what Rob didn't know is that the day we got let go um, was also the day that uh, I tested positive for COVID. Uh, so so did Moj, so did Ryan Henderson and uh that's all that I know of it's the extent of the people that I know of at 1040. So I couldn't really commit to anything when I was laid flat out. So that's, this is the first time I think I've, I've talked about it publicly, but uh, yeah, my, my wife had it. Um, I had it. My two boys had it and uh, we were laid flat out. So I told Rob, Hey, hang tight. Let me get better. And I'll, then we'll make a decision. Uh, fielded some other offers, but uh, Clay, I tell you, uh, um, I just kept, going back to check in large part because first of all, they were sending Rick Ryan and I um, a lifeline while we were, you know, drowning in the ocean, in the yeah. broadcasting ocean. Uh, so there was that, but if you check into Czech's story, sorry for using that uh, pun there, right. but if you check into their story, um, it just reminded me a lot of stations that I worked with in the past, like CKVU in Vancouver, like uh, CJDC in Dawson Creek and, uh, CKGY and Red Deer. In 09, CanWest Global, large corporate giant, was going to dissolve check, was going to get rid of it, much like uh, Bell did with TSN 1040. The employees stepped up and said, no, we're going to buy the station. We're going to get the help of some clients. And I did, and they've been a success story since then. And I felt bad because I really didn't know a whole lot about it. And I didn't realize how much I was actually watching it um, for, for whatever reason. So it really spoke to me. Uh, so there was that. Uh, that was really important to me. To after twenty years of twenty plus years of living in the corporate world, and there's there's pluses and minuses with every situation you're in. And certainly there were massive pluses working for Bell and working for Rogers. But I just felt maybe it was time to go back to where I started from, work for a local station, and g- give that a shot as my. Uh, 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 career winds down. I just, it just really, really spoke to me. The people are nice, very professional. You saw the logo and the promos they came up with us uh, last Tuesday when they released yeah. uh, the information. I was just blown away by it in a, in a lot of ways. So um, all those reasons combined, uh, here we are and we start on, uh, on April 5th. And I'm doing fine, by the way. Oh, good. Uh, uh, when it comes to COVID. Let me just say this uh, with COVID. Um, I, I saw a video by a person who is, uh, uh, had some b- bad publicity uh, recently. That's Ellen DeGeneres. And I kind of dismissed it because she got COVID and she talked about how the weirdest thing was how she had a sore back. Hmm. And that was the strangest symptom that I had. And I was almost happy to see that video to realize that it's actually a symptom of COVID and it's, it's still tweaking me a bit. I guess I'm a long hauler and it's the only symptom that's kind of hanging around. So when people talk about COVID, I had all the normal symptoms, not normal, nothing's yeah. normal about COVID, 
but I had all the symptoms that you've heard about, but this back situation was, was really strange. And then a couple of days ago, Kyle Lowry, who had COVID talked about it as well. So just a little COVID story for you, Clay, sorry to go off uh, on a left turn there. No, usually I call this Clay's Canucks commentary, but it can be Clay's COVID commentary. That's sure, fine. Yeah. Like, no. okay. <laughs> I appreciate, oh, I'm, firstly, first and foremost, I'm glad you and your family's healthy. Secondly, that thank you for sharing that. And uh, so honestly, and that's, that's crazy. So even if you didn't get that bad news on February 9th, there was a chance that your show, at least you'd have to do it remotely again. You guys were going, yeah, that's, that's nuts. Yeah. Yeah. It might, it might've happened. Uh, might've happened. Uh, sooner. Yeah. And, and let me also say this as an aside, I'm in the Port Moody area. And when it comes to COVID, the Port Moody area has been rather infamous lately. So let's, let's just leave it at that. <laughs> These people are wondering where I caught it. Well, I'm, I'm, I wasn't I, at that trivia night. Okay. I will say that. Okay. <laughs> Although you're good. Yeah, you're good at running the trivia, obviously. Yeah. From your sports yeah. pages. That wasn't you. <laughs> no, it wasn't me. <laughs> so when they call you, uh, so obviously, what a COVID notwithstanding, Don, what a relief that... Uh, and I, I think people knew that you would wind up on your feet uh, pretty quickly, d- depending on who and what. But was it, did they come to you and say, hey, it's you? Or is it, hey, we want you and Rick? Or is it you calling Rick? How did Rick get into this? Or was he part of the package right from the start? They wanted Rick. Um, and they want, I guess, Rick and I had done shows together. They wanted Rick. And uh, I got Ryan involved. Rick would, I, I, I think Rick would have landed on his feet in a second, no matter what. He brings so much to the table, yeah. uh, information, contacts, scoops, which not a lot of people do. I'm not good at that sort of thing. Um, he's just a real solid, solid broadcaster, great journalist, and uh, couldn't be happier uh, to have him aboard. That's awesome. And let me know if you need some East Asian flavor on the show too. Uh, I'll let you know. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. We're there. <laughs> Always. What can we expect? Speaking of the show, it's two hours, correct? Every day? Uh, two hours, Monday to Friday, 10 a.m. Yeah. When I tweeted it out, I tweeted 10 to 12. And I think a lot of people just assumed it was 10 p.m. Because ah. of the background. But it's 10 a.m. to 12, uh, 12 noon on check, uh, multiple platforms. It's going to stream. It's uh, going to be podcast. Wow. Uh, we're working on finding a radio partner a- as well. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be basically, Clay, it's going to be eavesdropping on our show, on our radio show. So you're going to be eavesdropping on a conversation between Rick and I. We'll play to the camera as well. But it's almost, it's going to be a radio talk show on television like you've seen, seen a lot. Yep. And uh, it, it should be a lot of fun. We're going to bring a lot of the elements that we had on our old show. Uh, Is it just me? DTMC? Uh, things like that. Uh, uh, top stories of the day. All, all of that we're going to bring as well. Big Ride, the Twitter guy, will make an appearance. Uh, we have to condense it a bit. It, it's two hours. Uh, let me just say this too, before we go any further, I'm not going to I- ignore this, but it was Donnie and the Moj for a long time and uh, Moj is going to land on his feet. Uh, he's uh, looking at uh, uh, going to wherever the Lions end up, wherever the BC Lions a- end up. And we're going to try to work him into our show as well. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, that, that's great to hear. Yes. Moj is very well connected for sure. And one thing I do want to ask you, because um, yeah, whether I was driving home or driving between meetings, I was always listening to your show. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, and I love all the features. Uh, I love how you guys poke fun. I, I just, honestly, Don, I just love the vibe. You guys, obviously you knew what you're talking about. You're very well connected, but it was fun. It sounded like two pals. And when Ryan gets thrown in there, three pals, just giggling, laughing. Uh, there's so many funny things. How do you put up with Moja's name dropping? <laughs> um, just by, uh, well, <laughs> Uh, the thing is with Moja's name dropping, which is great. And people want to hear those stories, I yeah. think. And uh, uh, once in a while, he'll get a story wrong. And uh, that makes up for all the, uh, all the name dropping. For instance, there's an infamous clip of him talking about uh, the day he hung out with David Pasternak. Uh, he was a black ace during the 2013 Stanley Cup final. I pointed out to Moj, um, that Pasternak wasn't drafted by the Bruins until 2014. So all that name dropping and, it, you know, time and time again, which I love, it's, it's, it's part of his personality. Yeah. Um, but I know it's, it's not for everybody, but it gets balanced out when he makes a mis- mistake like that. And, and you know, and I know about Pasternak being drafted in 2014 because he was passed over twice. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll say passed over once uh, by the Canucks. And the reason I say once is because, Nobody had him going in the top 10. So right. maybe you can excuse them there. But I guess in reality, he was passed over twice at the yeah. 2014 by, uh, uh, by the Canucks. So that's well known Jared by McCann, everyone right? in Vancouver except for one person. Yes. 
He was the pick after Jared McCann in the late. That's right. Round. Yes, right after. Just like, um, did you guys figure out who that Boston Bruins player was? He was hanging out with some guy named Dave in Boston, I guess. Maybe he was from the Czech Republic. I'm not really sure, but apparently Moj was drinking with him. Uh, that is a great story. Uh, the birth of um, segments that you it sounds like you're going to continue on DTMZ. Is it just me? Is that just you guys kind of hanging around saying, you know, we're going to talk about this anyways, why not wrap it like this kind of thing? Well, I think it makes it uh, easier to sell to a, to a sponsor, which is, yeah. you know, the lifeblood of our, our business. Uh, so there's that. And, you know, you know, this clay, you've been in the business long enough where, and not every day is a slam dunk where there's a, a trade, um, there's a firing, yeah. uh, there's a controversial play in, in, a, in a game the night before. And sometimes you just need regular features like that to make sure you can keep things interesting, to have a focus. It helps streamline things. And it, yeah. uh, I mean, I'll say it, it makes things a little bit easier for us Yes. Uh, when we know we've got that segment to do. And, and the thing is with a lot of our segments, mostly, um, uh, is it just me? Um, our audience takes care of it. And, yeah. they'll, uh, and they'll come up with suggestions through our inbox, uh, through emails, um, sometimes phone calls. So, um, that's one of that's one of the reasons and plus i think it helps brand your brand your show yeah. you know i'll ask the show with the dtmc that's the show with is it just me sure yeah great point and that's a great point about the content because you can imagine how i was dying for content on april, in april may june when they were figuring oh, out what yeah. was going to happen with the season <laughs> yeah <laughs> so yeah. tell me about um i'm impressed okay so i i I'll, I'll do a mea culpa. I did look up your, well, I looked something up on Wikipedia and I think it said your age. I'm not going to say it here. So I, I, let's just say this, Don, I'm impressed that you know so much about pop culture for your age, which isn't astronomically high. It's just, I, I'm just impressed. Like whether you're doing birthdays or DTMZ, um, how do you have your finger on the pulse of pop culture and sports? Or is that, is that Lisa and your kids helping you out too? Oh, yeah, well, for sure. Uh, there's that. I've always, look, I was a six of six kids. So I was in the corner watching a lot of TV and I think my mom and dad knew I existed. I'm not sure. <laughs> they were great parents, by the way. <laughs> but, uh, they were pretty practiced at having kids by then. So, you, you know, you've got three. It's, a, you know, like it, the, the, the way we treated our first one, even on the ride home from the hospital was different, you know, than, than the third one. So my mom and dad had six. So I just watched, you know, watched a lot of TV, played a lot of sports, that sort of thing. So I was always into that, always into you know, uh, watching television, reading books, staying up on pop culture, it's just in my blood. And my brothers and sisters were into it as well, especially my brothers when it came to sports. Yes. I've always, I've always been interested in that. And then, you know, I got to, you know, I was in TV for a long time. So uh, that made me even more interested in, in that business. And I don't know, it's just in my blood. It is, I really enjoy entertainment. It's great, great escapism. And for some reason, I just absorb a lot of the stuff, even the, stu the, the uh, uh, current programs. Awesome. So let's, let's work backwards to that. Ultimately, I want to get to your sports page days. Um, so we, nine years, right? At TSN 1040. Well, I, actually, you know what, uh, Clay, if yeah. you include all the, I work, I started with Dave Pratt in 2003. Yep. I worked at 1040 in terms of just raw years, not necessarily full-time status longer than anywhere else. Wow. I worked at the 12, uh, pardon me, 17 years, over 17 wow. Close, close to 18, yeah. So you're doing radio with Dave at the same time you're doing Sportsnet Connected, is yeah, that? That's right, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I do the show with Dave and then and then uh, hustle over to Sportsnet and do that. Uh, wow. Sometimes, uh, two shows, sometimes one uh, on yeah. Sportsnet. But uh, I did those uh, three, four hours with Dave and that was uh, that was something else. And, uh, and uh, so, yeah, I spent 17, 18 years at, at 1040 full-time since 2014 it was my only job since uh, 2014 right okay that makes sense so and that's when you left sportsnet okay before we get to sportsnet um i know everyone's asked you about this but because i'm such a big fan of you and i enjoy poker and you know where i'm going yeah, just very sure. quickly do you and dave like joke about it now or oh, we joked about it two days later <laughs> and people thought it was fake uh, it was real trust me um we had a bad moment. We had, we had a, Dave and I were on the air, I think, for eight, nine years. We had one bad day. Well, we had a few bad days, but that was the one that was most infamous. And uh, I just stood up with him. I, I just uh, stood up to him, rather, and he didn't like it, and he left the studio. So that was – and it was real, trust me. There was hatred in that, in that room that day. Um, 
I think things got misconstrued. I, I didn't never said poker wasn't a sport. I just didn't think it was as tough as as tough as golf or as tough as hockey. Sure. And um, I just I, I thought Dave wanted me to come back at him, and I guess that particular day he didn't. <laughs> that was the <laughs> he he wanted me to agree with him, and it was you know, he had an outrageous argument, which I'm sure he to this day would would stand by. And I stood up to him, and two minutes later I was by myself in the studio <laughs> it, it was just so funny because you can hear <laughs> you can hear dave getting more and more agitated and really harping on the same point not really expanding his point you yeah. i thought i love your your doe brunson references your go fish references like, yeah. Just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it was uh, but you know it's funny I, I guess it was good radio at the time when you're that mad at somebody you don't really think of it that way Sure. So my gears were turning. Like, what, what can I come up here? And, uh, and then I knew something was up when Rob Gray, our program director, came into the control room and started watching. <laughs> well, and, and then I'm like, uh oh, this is this is not going to end well. Yeah, it was uh, it was quite the day. It lives on in infamy. Yes, maybe the top uh, moment of that station's history. But thank yeah. you for we're walking down memory lane with me. Let's talk quickly about Sportsnet and uh, Sportsnet Connected. You were there for how many years? 13. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. All shot here, correct? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Wish I spent a lot of time in Toronto yeah. or whatever assignment, like the Olympics or sure. um, uh, when they were refurbishing our studio. I, I spent a lot of time in, in Toronto. I really actually liked it. I know people may not find that hard to believe, but I really yeah. liked uh, the city. Uh, yeah. But 13 years, most of it uh, in uh, that the International Village in Chinatown, mm -hmm. downtown east side ish uh, studio that Sportsnet uh, uh, bought or purchased, I believe, from TSN. So, and, and, and we were down there for 13 years and, and then eventually made our way to 180 West Sac and the City TV. But yeah. uh, I liked it. It was, it was different. It was different. I'm not sure we never, we were supposed to be more focused on Vancouver. Hmm. I, don't know if we, I don't know if we ever really nailed it. <laughs> but, uh, the people I worked with were great. Yes. And what was exciting when that came in, obviously Sportsnet started to become a, a true competitor to TSN, at least yeah. on both yeah, national and local levels for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I thought so. I and mean, then there was a time there where we were killing them in, 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 on the West Coast, uh, beating them in, in the ratings. Yeah. And it was great. Uh, I never saw any money from that. But still... Uh, it was it was successful for a significant significant period of time. And then, as often uh, is the case, the you know the boss has changed and they had a new plan. But it lasted a long time. And in this business, thirteen years is pretty good. Yeah, and I think that's a good segue as we go backwards. I, I do want to spend a few minutes talking about Sports Page because that's truly what I grew up on. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about the, the jump from Sports Page, a quote local show, to uh, um, a Sportsnet connected type thing. Was that a difficult jump for you, or is that pretty natural? Um, it was difficult in a couple of ways. One being that I was disconnected, again, pardon the pun, from Toronto where everything was run. Like our control room was in Toronto. Mm -hmm. When I was doing the show, we had a one second delay on, pardon me, one second. I wish it was one second. It was a six or seven second delay wow. on everything that ran on, on all our videos. So doing the highlights was a bit of a challenge. So uh, there was that. And it was just different. It was just a different. There was a lot of pushback as to what should what should run where, you know, um, yeah. With some people there, there wasn't a whole lot of respect uh, for what was going on in Vancouver, and uh, so there was that. There were th those were the two big challenges: that delay and being disconnected from Toronto, and sometimes getting pushback as to what you know what what was important to a Vancouver audience, which I was told that we were supposed to be focused on, but some people didn't see it that way. But they yeah. treated me really well. Good. And I got to experience uh, a Toronto. Like I said, I went there a lot. I, I really, really liked it and worked with some gr great people. And uh, for the most part, it was a, a whole lot of fun. Good. Well, I can imagine, Don, the, the push-pull there with the Toronto-Vancouver, you know, uh, aspect. I think that would be a yeah. challenging thing for anyone. And, and let me just say, too, it's funny. In our business, there's a lot of that from the Vancouver types or the Western types. That, like all of us in broadcasting just seem to hate Toronto. <laughs> Pratt would tell me for years. He says, "Oh, you're going to see what it's like, you know. Now that you're working for a network and corporate and all that stuff." And I'm like, "Ah, it'll be fine." And it, it, it's he was right. It yeah. was absolutely uh, uh, right. And uh, so when I go on the show, and this is still going to happen on Donnie and Dolly, 
Um, when I go on the show and rip into Toronto, it's not so much the city or the people. It's mostly just about the coverage. <laughs> like, just like, you know, you know, Austin, this one story sticks out for me. I talked about it on the radio a million times. There was one day the Canucks, I forget what the trade was, but they made a trade. And the lead story on TSN and Sportsnet was that Austin Matthews was playing defense at practice. <laughs> as a joke, as because he lost a bet. And, and it just drove me nuts. And, and I went on about it way too much. We got in heck from the boss and all that stuff. So uh, that's kind of where it comes from. It's not a Toronto hate. It's just the way that... Uh, you know, Western teams and Western fans are treated sometimes by the, yeah. oftentimes. Well, I think that part, this part of the uh, interview with you, uh, chat with you is going to resonate with a lot of people uh, watching this. So thank you for that. Okay, let's get to sports page. Okay. How many years were you there? S over 16, 16 and a half. From 80... 84 to 2000. Okay. So, so really basically for more to, to late 2000. Awesome. So I was born in 74. So I did watch... All 16 years of you. So I was from 10, oh, 10 to 26 years old. Um, I just want, uh, let's just start off with some of your favorite catchphrases. I, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to make you do sure. them. You don't want it, but I'd love to hear the genesis of them. Uh, Marv Alberts, the gorgeous move and the yes, just you, you liked it. Well, you know what? Uh, actually, that kind of came from uh, as much as anything. Uh, I talked about watching TV a lot. Uh, David Letterman, who I adore to this day had a regular uh, uh, staff member by the name of Chris Elliott. And he used to come on and do the show and he used to impersonate uh, Mara Valver. You can look it up, it's on YouTube. And he'd do a lot of, yes, and it's a gorgeous move. So as, uh, yeah, it's, it came from Mara, but a lot of that came from Chris Elliott and his impersonation of Mara Valver. I don't know if you remember, he'd come on with a big toupee. And, oh yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and to impersonate uh, Mara Valver. So that's kind of where that came from. So I just thought I'd work it into the, uh, into the highlights especially during a Knicks game no of course I love yeah. it and I'm don't worry Don I'm not gonna uh you know I'm not gonna make you do all these but if you could do me one uh what how would you describe if Nikolai Habibulin made an amazing save in the in the maybe with one of his pads yeah the guy he, he, you know Habibulin makes he got it with his left Habib or was it his right Bulin? I'm not sure and then on from there where did that one that, see that one is when I kind of uh you know tease out on Twitter that I'd be uh uh, uh, chatting with you. That's the one that a lot of people bring up. Where did that one come from? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Just wordplay, just having fun. I like that sort of stuff. And that was, that was, that was one that just kind of uh, came one day. I have no idea where, <laughs> but I miss Speaking it. Of word... <laughs> Speaking of wordplay, when someone, and I, I rec, I tried fooling around with this one. I know it's easier when the guy's name ends in N, but you know, if Ekman Larson had a nice shot, you would say that it was a shot in Ekman Larsonian fashion. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I try. It sometimes doesn't work with a guy like Burroughs or something. Oh, Burroughs. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, so that, was that, that, just would, a... that would really work. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, sure. I mean, it would, uh, Pedersonian fashion, that sort of thing. That is a play on um, growing up. Uh, so many of us, our favorite play by play announcer was Jim Robson, followed closely by Danny Galvin. Yes. And Danny Galvin used to say, Savardian spin around. There's yes. a Savardian spin around which by the way, uh, this is a mistake a lot of people make, uh, was in honor of Serge Savard, not Danny Savard. Serge right. Savard, first, uh, the first person Danny Galvin referred to uh, with Savardi and Spinorama. So I just kind of took it from there. Right? And Danny Galvin is one that you'd like to do a lot as well. Is that correct? Oh, gathering speed. Yeah. Yeah. An enormous save. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'd refer to Dick Irvin, who was often his uh, color analyst. That sort of scintillating shot. And anytime, anytime anybody got a, a puck caught up in his equipment, he, it wasn't his equipment, it was paraphernalia. Danny Gallo would always say that. And he had this awesome, I don't know, almost like a Shakespearean type voice. He got caught up in his paraphernalia, Dick Irvin. I just loved it. It was just, it was, he was just so different. Yeah. Skating gingerly was another one that uh, Danny Galvin used all the time. But getting back to Savardi and it was it, now it's Pedersonian, uh, yes. that sort of thing. Pusian doesn't really work, <laughs> but that's where that came from. Nicely done. Come on, more, often, um, sorry, sorry, Clay, but I often like to um, pay tribute to people that I really, really admired growing up. Danny Galvin was one of them. Yeah. Another thing I would often say, you know, is the Canucks uh, now leading one nothing in their home 
blues with the green and white trim, touch of silver in there. That's a tribute to Jim Robson. Jim Robson would always start every game talking about the color of the team's uniforms. And I grew up on, uh, on Jim, on CKNW, on radio, which was just fabulous. And uh, that, that, that was a tribute to Jim. Uh, Don, that really speaks to me because I, I often tell a story when people ask me, how did you become a Canucks fan? Obviously, back then, not all the games were televised. So it was me, my brother, and my dad lying on his bed, oh. listening to Jim Robson and Tom oh. Larshide. And he would say right at the very start, going left to right, the Canucks in their blue and white. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's yeah. So that, that, that was all. That, that was a tribute to, 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 to Jim Robson. And then, um, the other thing that um, I used to do is uh, mention uh, old numbers. Um, so, you, you, you know, um, somebody would uh, score a goal, uh, you know, um, uh, let, let's say uh, Dan, uh, Dan Ham, Hughes scores a goal and um, he does so wearing Doug Hall result number two. And one of the reasons I did that is you, you get to know the players, yeah. especially the older players, and not all of them are gazillionaires. Um, I'm talking about the, the older players. And I just, you know, picture myself, not necessarily with Doug, uh, he's still in the Vancouver area, um, but uh, uh, other people. Uh, and I just picture them, you know, maybe somewhere in Sault Ste. Marie or Flin Flon, and they're watching Sportsnet, or or if they're in BC and Sports Page, and you know, if I if I brought up their name, it would be a it would be a big deal. I think that means a lot to those guys. Again, maybe you're reaching one or two people, but I've always been a numbers guy, and I think yeah. uh, I, I also, you know, ca care about those older players and that. And I know if you can reach out and mention the name. I think people get a kick about hearing about the old names as well. Absolutely. Oh, I know. I've seen clips of you talking about Robert Cron's old number, Robert Dirk's. It's just, yeah. You can go on and on, obviously. Yeah. yeah. No, I just, I just love that sort of stuff. Tell me, tell me about, tell me about how Jim Van Horn's mustache and Hazel May are judging fights. <laughs> I have no idea. That one just, that just came out of nowhere. <laughs> I, I, I have no, no idea. Yeah, that one, uh, the Hazel May one might not pass muster these days because it was her leather skirt uh, yes. <laughs> judging the, uh, the fights. Somehow I got away with it. I don't know. I don't know. Just the thought of just Jim, not just Jim Van Horn, but just his mustache at the, <laughs> in an arena judging a fight, maybe holding up a placard. <laughs> I know, that was a good visual. Oh, it was so funny. Okay, last one. Um, simply like uh, rippling the mesh, bulging the twine, upstairs where mom keeps the peanut butter. Yeah, just different way of saying things yeah. as opposed to he shoots these scores, just a different way of saying things. I remember my dad saying, uh, um, uh, top shelf where mom keeps the peanut butter. Just something corny like that. I know I got accused of being cliche and uh, saying things way too much, but my answer to that was, well, everybody else is just saying he scores. So yeah. I don't know. I just try to jazz it up, you know, once or twice a show. I don't think it's that big a deal. I just, it was just a, everything I'm talking about here, just about having fun. Totally. And I think sometimes we forget um, why we got into sports. Why did we get into sports? It's because it was fun. Yeah. You're trying to put a black rubber biscuit in a net. Mm -hmm. You're trying to get this oblong leather pigskin ball over a line. Like, come on, it's fun. And people forget about that. And uh, just everything's so serious now. And, uh, well, you know, it, it, I, I, I'm not, <laughs> not going to criticize anybody, but I just think that things have changed. And for a lot of people, it really works. But I like, I like, I, I like the fun aspect of it all. Oh, you hit the nail on the head, Don. You just have to go, as we talked about before we press record, you just go on Twitter and every day there's a different fight about something in the Canucks fan base. It's kind of fun. I, I, and I get it. I, I, get, I get the addiction of social media and, and arguments. Trust me, going back to what uh, Pratt and I were up to. I, I, I get all that, but I just, I think we got to remember every once in a while that sports is supposed to be at its root. We all got into it. Every single one of us, not, not one single person. We got into it because it's kind of fun. Well you know. said. And I, you know, I like your cliches if you call them, or maybe you call them catchphrases now because yeah. it's, a, they stand out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, and I, again, I don't want to criticize anybody, but I think there's a generic quality to sports casting now, especially in this country. And uh, nothing bothers me more than when you'll watch a sports cast at seven o'clock, eight o'clock on a network. And they'll do a highlight package of a game that's just finished. And they go, uh, 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 and when I say they, uh, I'm not talking about all sportscasters, but a lot, a lot of them, they'll, they'll read a script. Mm -hmm. 
And then you see that same highlight package by another person at 10, 11, they have the same script. They're doing the exact same thing. They're not having any fun with it. And and it's fine that there's a generic quality now uh, that, um, and again, I'm I'm gonna sound like an old man, but I don't know, just that that wasn't necessarily there in the past. Um, I I, I think there are exceptions out there. Man, I love Jay and Dan. I I just love that whole show and I love love Jay. Uh, Dan no longer uh, on that show. That was yeah. I just loved what they what they did. They just go, had fun, goofed around. They realized what sports was all about. I I I just loved that. I just thought it was just just fabulous. Absolutely. And, and they weren't generic. That's one thing you cannot say about they weren't cookie cutter. And I know Jay isn't either. For sure. Uh, thank no. Thank you for uh, for indeed sharing all those. Uh, one last question about sports page. Are you surprised on that so many? Sports page alum have gone on to have very successful both either national or local careers. It's it's quite remarkable when you look at it. Yeah, I, I can't say I am, and and let let me go back to the start of it for all of us. I, I I'm not surprised because so first of all, you know, we were doing a kick-ass show. I think yeah. uh, every night. So so there was that. But uh, my late great boss Paul Carson had this knack of picking people that were that would work and that had a lot of potential. Like, I'll be honest, Clay, there were times when he hired somebody and we'd, and we'd go, what? Like, <laughs> this guy over that guy? Are you kidding? He goes, hey, I know what I'm doing. Randorf. Randorf, when, when Dave got hired, there was a couple other guys. And, you know, we were in the background, you know, the junior employees. Like, are you going for the, the Randorf? What? What? He goes, right. hey, just take it easy. I know what I'm doing here. And, man, was he, was he bang on. Wow. It, it, Dave was just fabulous, just just great. Yeah, and there are other examples of that. Paul just had this knack. I, I was working in Red Deer at a country music uh, radio station doing sports, not much TV, and uh, I sent in a resume tape, and he hired me. But I think it was different with me versus Dave because I think with me he took one look at the tape and said, "Hey, you know, we can get this guy for cheap. Yeah, you know, uh, we can get this guy for like maybe six, seven hundred dollars a month." <laughs> So, and then I, and then I, I got lucky enough to get some experience in sports page, but anyway, no, Paul, Paul had this great, God bless his soul, had this uh, knack of, of picking out uh, talent like nobody else. So the fact that everybody, so many of the people from there moved on to uh, supposedly bigger and better things, no surprise at all. It all, yeah. all comes and, down. And it's funny you mentioned, you know, Paul Carson, a uh, wonderful, wonderful person and it's funny you mentioned the the whole uh radio station country music station because one of my favorite things you and uh, mojo do would try and hit the post and i.e uh, do an outro as as the music comes on just before the lyrics come on yes. one of the funniest things you guys did i, I think you were a lot better at it than mojo admittedly yeah and you know what it's, yeah it's called hitting the post for people who aren't broadcasting and you know who cares about it very few people <laughs> like, like the only people who care about it are broadcasters man he hit the post well he stops you know, speaking right when the singer started singing, you know, how that added to the a person's entertainment value. I have no idea, but for us in the business, Oh, that guy's good. He can hit the post like nobody, no one cares. <laughs> well, as a music lover, uh, this, here's one guy who does care. So thank you for that. Okay, good, good. Yeah. All right. Let's do a, a couple Canucks related questions. Um, yeah. Whether you, you look at it through the eyes of a fan or a broadcaster or whatever, um, what do you think of the Canucks' recent play, and do they have a hope and heck of pulling this out and making the playoffs somehow, even if that's not the best thing for their long-term development? Yeah. What do I think of Thatcher Demko's recent play? Is that what you're asking me? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's just, I think they got themselves a really good goalie. That's what I think of their recent play. <laughs> so, so there's that. And, you know, the fact they're doing it without Pedersen, uh, which nobody would have guessed. Again, that probably comes down to, <laughs> to Thatcher Demko. I mean, this past month has been all about 35, uh, I think. I just, uh, I'm really blown away by just how, how different they seem from what they look like in the bubble. Yeah. I think a lot of us are. They look so confident and that nothing would, would phase them. They, they fall down 2 nothing, one nothing. I, you knew they were going to come back and yeah. you just don't feel that this year. In fact, the exact opposite is true. They'll they'll get a lead and you know, they're going to blow it. And they, and they do. Now I know they've been winning um, and, and gathering points a lot lately. That has, yeah. has a lot to do with the uh, Demko, but I almost just, I just watch, I just think the whole league has figured them out. I, I tweeted this 
one of my few tweets, I, I tweeted out that how many times this year have you seen the Canucks do cross ice passes? Like, like from one side of the ring, especially on the power play, they, Hey guys, they know what you're doing. Yeah. Like, like they, they, they figured this, this team out. And I, and I, I realized there's a bit of a playoff push here. They've been playing better lately. It has a lot to do with the Demco, but there's just some little things that, that, that bother me. And, you know, I, I wonder about Clay, uh, Quentin Hughes, um, a durability. He's yeah. playing, playing a whole lot. It's just some really strange things going on. What about Travis Green hanging in there? You've got other coaches in this Northern division who have been let go. Yeah. And here's the guy without a contract extension hanging on and, and he's still there. Like, what's the plan? I don't, I don't really know if you, if you believe in this guy, well show us because it seems like they, they, they don't. And meanwhile, you've got Claude Julien who did some pretty good things in the bubble last year. Mm -hmm. Team got off to a great start. Just ask the Canucks and he's gone and Travis Green I would have expected him to be the, fir the the first one and now you've got all these waiver wire pickups it's just I don't again I really don't know what the plan is it's just a, a a real mystery and then on the other hand you've got these spectacular moves they've made I mean it looks like Hoaglander is you yeah. know and would you like to see more production from him yeah they've got some spectacular moves that Jim Benning has made um mm -hmm. it's it just I just don't know. I'm really confused. And I don't think I'm alone when it comes to Canuck Nation. Well, just think, Don, if we were doing this chat next week, we'd maybe have uh, the whole bottom six of Toronto on our roster by then. It's, it's, yeah, it's, well, it's, should, yeah, give it a while. It, it'll happen. <laughs> yeah. But you make you make a great point about the plan. I think that's that's a tricky thing when it comes to this team. And and I think it's exasper, exasper, whatever the word is, magnified on on Twitter when people are arguing about this because – you can, you can still be a fan of and want them to win games now and want them to push for the playoffs, but you can also still say, what is the plan? And I would like to see more of a blueprint of something. Mm -hmm. Like, would you like to be in Detroit right now? Like, would you like to put, not in Detroit, not, not, I don't mean living there. Okay, how about this? Would you like to be a Red Wings, Red Wings fan? No. It's frustrating right? And, and they're losing all of that, but there seems to be a focus. There is, there, there, there is a focus. And I've never felt that with, with uh, this or uh, this particular era. Yeah. So I, I think that's what fans are kind of begging for, but it just seems like they change with the wind a lot and it's, it's, it's frustrating. It, it really is. And I, I just wonder since 2014, look, Jim's hung on. He's the second highest tenured GM in Canuck history behind only Pat Quinn. He's wow. spent more years as GM than Burke, Nonis, Gillis, anybody else except Pat. Yeah. So hats off to him for surviving at the very least. Yeah. I just wonder, I just, to this day, I still wonder about, uh, uh, about focus. Yeah. Right? Two playoff runs in those seven years, right, Don? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And one was in the first year, which might've been the worst thing, right? <laughs> Give them false hope. Yeah, yeah, we made it on a year where we brought in Willie, Trevor, and Jim all in the same year. That's crazy. It, it really is. And then they got exposed in that in that first round. Yes, it was also the worst. You know, also, and I don't want to pick on anybody here. But, <laughs> you know, unfortunately, Flame, the Flames' best player may have been Michael Furland. And four or five years later, the Canucks couldn't forget about that. Yeah, yeah, totally. And and that's the thing. Like without going too much into revisionist history, yeah, when, when they signed him two years ago. We're like, wow, this is the one guy who struck fear in every single Canucks defenseman that, that series in 2015. Oh, I, I was afraid. We, we, we went to every game in Calgary and Vancouver, and I was afraid of uh, <laughs> afraid of Furland. See, I think that's a worse signing than Louis Erickson, and I'll, and I'll tell you why. Yeah. Because with Louis Erickson, you look back, look at the comments. Um, you know, look at you know, some people who know a whole lot more about hockey than, than I do, um, which is a large list. Um, people like that. They didn't. They didn't mind that uh, that signing. People in Vancouver were okay with thirty goal score, yeah. six years, six six years, six million per. Yeah, they overpaid for him, but there wasn't a whole lot of criticism when they signed Furland. It was what are you doing? Yeah. What you have four years? Like what? What, what the concussion problems? Really? Yeah. And, and yeah, he got seventeen goals the year before in Carolina, but the bulk of those were at the, in the first half of the season. So there was a lot of criticism when they made that deal, when they made that signing. Yeah. I think it was, and from that point of view, I think it was a, 
it was poor judgment with that signing than it was with Ericsson. As bad as Ericsson has turned out, when you look at the initial reaction, people were, all of us, we were all for it. I remember having a lot of our experts on that day and they were like, oh, this guy's, this guy's the real deal. Yep. And uh, it hasn't worked out. Good point about Erickson. On that day, you might remember, Don, there was a bunch of bad contracts handed out. Uh, yeah. Alposo, Nielsen, all those guys. Back has got all big, yeah, big contracts yeah. on that July 1st, for sure. All right, yeah. one last question, then we'll, we'll yeah, move to... Yes. Um, are you sick of this North Division, or are you still digging it? Do you still like, I like it? I like it. I don't think long-term I would. <laughs> you know, it's, you know, there's not a lot, a lot of variety there, in case you, <laughs> you haven't noticed, but uh, the thing that I like, and I, again, long-term, n- no, you want varieties, the spice of life. So yeah. you, you want that. But the one thing that is great about it, and the timing is just fluky, is that six of the seven teams are really good, really fun to watch. And even Ottawa. Was yeah. good, good, good. Like that, they're fun to watch. You know, Thomas Shabbat doesn't go off the ice. Even them, they're, they're the seventh team that I was talking about. They're, they're actually, there's, there's something there. They have a focus, it, it seems, and that's the future. Yeah. Um, with a lot of pain right now, but maybe it, it pays off. But Toronto's great to watch. Say what you want about the Leafs. They're great to watch. They're talented, super cocky and arrogant. I like watching them. I, yeah. They're great. They're fast. Montreal's Montreal with a lot of good players. Great finish to last year. Great start to this year. There's definitely a, a talent there. Winnipeg is surprised at everybody. You know, great forward group. Oh, yeah. Uh, Edmonton and Calgary. McDavid, Dreisaitl, you get to watch them nine, time, nine, ten times a year. I'll take that any time. I'll take that in, during any season. Yeah. And Calgary's fun with all the ex-Canucks and a lot of talent. They've been a coaching change. Sutter is there. No, there's a lot of great stories. And people thought Vancouver was going to do a whole lot better than they have. Um, and if there, there's talent there. So I think the timing is right for this. But over the long run, I think people are going to, you know, they're probably going to want to see Matthew Barzell coming to Vancouver, right? Agreed. Yeah, yeah. we, yeah, Sid and Al, yeah, the players from basically the other 24 teams, absolutely. Okay, Don, we're going to wrap up with this. I call it my five hole for obvious reasons. Sure. Five very quick questions. You can answer these as briefly or as deeply as you want to. You ready to go? Mm, yes. All on. right. What is the f- sport that you excel playing right now and when you're growing up? So two questions there. Well, it's not golf, and uh, <laughs> which is probably the only sport I play other than walking uh, right now. <laughs> yeah. um, skiing, no. Oh, uh, uh, but uh, the sport that I played the most growing up, I played a lot of hockey. Nice. Uh, but the sport that I really, really played a lot of and did well at was lacrosse. Cool. Yeah, cool. box lacrosse. I played cool. Auburn back in the day, and I'm sure you've heard Moj talk about it. Um, yes. You know, really really good team uh, paulo bernero was on it lloyd simons a whole bunch of great great uh players that lacrosse people uh would know and we went to canadian championships and the team that we were often matched up against was saanich uh, led by a guy by the name of john horgan yes who was, a pretty, who, was a, who was a pretty good lacrosse player so i i my whole family was involved in lacrosse and uh, i just always had a soft spot for that sport awesome awesome number two if you were starting a team from scratch, Elias Pettersson or Quinn Hughes? Quinn Hughes. And maybe that has to do with being a long-suffering Canuck fan and being around since 1970 and knowing that the Canucks have never had a player like that. Have they had a player like Pettersson? I mean, you could argue a yes or no, but I know this. They definitely have never had a guy uh, like Quinn Hughes on the ice all the time. Does he make mistakes? Yeah, I take them because of what what uh, the great moments he comes up with. They've never had a player uh, like that. I respect the heck out of Elias Pettersson. I think he's more replaceable. And again, this is not a, yep. a criticism, just my opinion. I think he's more replaceable than Quinn Hughes. I, he's just so much fun to watch. And I think he just means uh, so much. Best defense is a good offense. And he yep. provides that. Like I actually there. agree with you. And, you know, we want Patterson to come back, but even this oh, yeah. recent three weeks uh, stint, if we do that, we're not doing that without Quinn Hughes. I think that's fair to say. Great point. Great uh, point. Number three, and you won't offend me because I'm half of both cultures. Favorite food, ja- uh, no, uh, favorite food between these two, Japanese food or Chinese food? I'll go Japanese and, I, and I'll tell you why. Uh, because <laughs> it's, it, I'm going back in the past here. Chinese food, my, we used to go to Chinatown all the time, like on Pender Street. My, we, that's where we had our big family dinners. So soft spot, absolutely. But one of my brothers, um, 
used to go to, oh gosh, I can't remember the place. It was called Aki on Powell Street. This is in the 70s. And we used to go there to have raw fish. This is before it had, this was before it took off. Yeah. So I always felt like our family, at least my brother, was ahead of the curve when it came to Japanese food. I loved it right off the bat. It was so different from anything I'd ever had and delicious. So I always had a soft spot for both, but I, I like to think that myself, my family, were a little ahead of the curve. Remember, when Japanese food just took off in the eighties. Yeah. We were ahead of the curve. We were we were, we were ahead ahead of that. When the only Japanese restaurants I remember that you could find in Vancouver were on Powell Street mm-hmm. near Open mm-hmm. Oppenheimer Park. And Very cool. Uh, yeah, I'm bo- so my late father, uh, so Imo is a Japanese name. So my late father was okay. Japanese and my, my mom's Chinese. Yeah, and it's, it's funny. The thing that I got out of that answer was that you guys had family dinners at Chinese restaurants, it sounds like. Yeah, uh, we, yes. Uh, yeah. Um, there was the New Diamond, uh, which was actually on Main. Mm-hmm. Uh, the uh, the uh, Way In. There's, there was the Ho Ho and the Ho In. I, we used to go to all of them. Uh, and we'd have these massive family dinners in large part because, you know, you know, the, 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 you go to the Chinese restaurants in Chinatown back in the day. And I haven't been there for a long time. And I apologize. I should, should be doing that more and carrying on the tradition with my, my kids, but they used to have these massive tables, yeah, massive yeah. round tables where you could fit 20. I, like I just, I told you earlier, I have a huge family, these massive round tables, you could fit so many people around so they could, they could handle our family. It was just that. that. Absolutely. Yeah. And you, and you twirl the lazy Susan and you yes. can just pick off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And okay. And, and, and also you, you probably know this, but you know um, the liquor laws were a little uh, more strict back then. And those restaurants <laughs> didn't let you uh, sneak in a, a bottle or two. So there was that. I was young at the time, so I wasn't doing that, but other members of my family. Awesome. Taylor yeah. family secrets. Uh, continue on this theme of uh, food. Number four. Let's say this guy is taking you out for dinner and he's paying for you and you just got to sit there and eat and talk to them. Who are you going out to dinner with? Travis Green, Jim Benning, or Francesco Accolini? Mm. Well, Accolini has the most money, so that's that's tempting. I don't think he'd be handing any over to me. Oh, God. I, I got to say, say Jim Benning just because uh, we're around the same age. And uh, because I'd love to talk about the old Western hockey league days. Mm. Now, people might find this hard to believe, but uh, as you get older, uh, you know, the, the body takes on a different shape. Jim Benning was a hell of a player. And I remember watching him at Queens Park Arena with the Portland Winterhawks, wearing, I believe, I think he wore number four for the Winterhawks. He was compared to Bobby Orr. Wow. Look at his, look at his numbers in Portland, a particular one season. Okay. He was going to be one of, and, and there were a million next Bobby Orr's, by the way. Sure. It wasn't just Jim, but he was the real deal. He was fabulous to watch. Fabulous to watch. Put up big points. Unfortunately, got drafted by the Harold Ballard era Toronto Maple Leafs. Mm. Was rushed into the NHL at 18 or 19 years old. Jim will, Jim will tell you about it. I love to talk to him about that. <laughs> um, and, and there were um, uh, several young Leafs that were rushed in at that, at that time. And Jim was one of them. They weren't very good. And he had some good seasons, eventually got traded to Vancouver. Uh, one of the knocks with Jim uh, back in the day was he was small. He wasn't the biggest guy. He wasn't the biggest guy. They had the puck a lot, got bumped off the puck. But he was so good. I'd love to talk to him about uh, those days back in, in Portland. Uh, Ken Hodge, Brian Shaw, all, all of that. Uh, the Remchucks, all, all of that. I'd love to talk to him about that. Or certainly about what's happening now with the Canucks and his days with Buffalo and Anaheim. There's just a, there's just a whole lot to a whole lot there. And the fact he's got some nephews that are really good hockey players mm. as, as we know yep. as well. And, you know, his dad, right. I mean, his dad was a scout for the Montreal Canadians and he was based in Edmonton. Like wow. the stories he, he must have would be or, or just endless. So, so even forgetting about what's happening with the Canucks right now, Jim would be really fascinating. They all would be, but in particular, Jim would be fascinating to talk to. I've talked to him a bit, but nothing like that. Yeah. I agree with you. He seemed to be a really good storyteller for sure. And uh, lastly, and you can, Don, take a, take, take a second to think about your answer for this one. What's one thing that people don't know about Don Taylor that, that you don't mind sharing? Uh, you already shared the COVID story, which I was really appreciative, but what's one other thing that maybe people don't know about Don Taylor? Um, 
I'm married with three kids. So, so there's that. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, I'll, I'll tell you something. Do you like this painting in the background? I do. I noticed it as soon as we came on. Yep. Yeah, I did that. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I like to paint and draw. That's wow. That's pretty impressive. Do you care to give your, your representation here, or your ex explanation? Um, my, my uh, dad's family was full of the, like real artistic people. And I guess I just picked it up from them. And uh, that was what originally what I was supposed to be doing, like graphic arts back in the day. And uh, just never uh, got, got into broadcasting. So I didn't pursue it because things were going well with the broadcasting. Yeah. But, yeah. That's, uh, that's, uh, I've got a few of them around the house here. And uh, basically it's whenever I'm in a bad mood, I do a painting. Well, hopefully there's not too many paintings though then, but that's awesome. You have paintings and I just, print out pictures of my family and stick them up on my wall. So that yours are my, a little more creative. Well, I don't know about that. Those are pretty good. You, you, you know, it looks like you have a level, so that's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we did all right. Well, Don, this was wonderful. Thank you. And how fitting that you're resurrecting your, you're resurrecting your TV career on Easter Monday next week. I think that's really, really exciting. So um, thanks for your time today and best of luck uh, going forward with, Rick Dollywell and Ryan Henderson on Czech TV. Where can people follow you, follow the show, or at least follow you on Twitter? At Don Taylor Five uh, is where you can uh, follow me. And uh, obviously uh, the Czech Twitter account, Czech website, all of that. Uh, but if you want to DM me at uh, Don Taylor Five, uh, I'm more than welcome. You're more than welcome to uh, join in the conversation. Awesome. I appreciate your time. And thanks for taking that walk down memory lane with all of us. Um, being a big fan, as you know, and I, I'm most grateful to you. So thank you, Don. Thanks, Lee.